So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce our keynote speaker of today, uh, as Professor Linda Hogan, who is Professor of Ecumenics at Trinity College, Dublin. She has a rich publishing record going back to about uh, 2000, focusing especially on ethics in some of its various dimensions, especially interdisciplinary ethics in healthcare, artificial intelligence, and of particular relevance to today's lecture, gender. She also has a experience in academic leadership at a, a, a senior level in Trinity College of Dublin. Uh, Linda will speak for about 30 minutes and I'm happy to hand over to her. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much, Frank, and uh, thank you to colleagues at the um, Laudato Si Research Institute for the invitation to speak at this conference on women, solidarity and ecology. Um, the title of my lecture today is um, uh, Gender, uh, Human Rights and the uh, vulner Vulnerabilities of Gender and the Climate Emergency. So, the alarm bells really do keep ringing. We're living in a climate emergency, as was noted by Scientific American in last January, citing 11,000 scientists from 153 countries. And while there's some debate about the use of the term emergency, there's no doubt about the urgency of the situation. Why emergency? Well, Scientific American says, because words matter. To preserve a livable planet, humanity must take action immediately. Of course, Laudato Si had already rung that alarm bell and added that the human environment and the natural environment deteriorate together, insisting that we cannot adequately combat environmental degradation unless we tend to the causes related to human and social degradation as well which affect the most vulnerable people on the planet. Now, Laudato Si has injected a new sense of purpose and direction into the global response to the climate emergency. And it's, it has positioned the ethical question as a matter of social justice and intergenerational solidarity. Moreover, it's recognized that the climate challenge is not simply one of many, but rather the broader backdrop for both ecological ethics and social ethics. Any solution, it argues, must be committed to combating poverty and inequality, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. Within this context, I'd like to suggest today that human rights can provide a framework for response in which the interconnectedness of the economic, political, environmental, and cultural dimensions of the emergency are foregrounded, but also one in which the perspective of vulnerable in individuals and communities is central. In this paper uh, this afternoon, therefore, I just discuss how existing gender-related vulnerabilities are amplified and reinscribed as the effects of environmental degradation become ever more severe. And I consider the value of to address these challenges. Now, some of you might question the utility of a category, that is human rights, that is so integral to modernity and therefore implicated in the economic and political structures that have underwritten the climate emergency. However, I'd like to argue that a human rights approach mandates certain ethical and political commitments that are essential if we are to tackle the inequities of climate change, particularly the gendered inequities. And here I'm influenced in part by the climate justice approach promoted by former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson in her Climate Justice Foundation, which requires commitments on human rights and gender equality as part of an overall agenda to address global warming and to stem the tide of climate change. But it's also an approach that rejects as a false dichotomy the trade-offs that we are often given between human rights and climate action. 
In addition, my approach to human rights is embedded in a feminist, decolonial, and subaltern reframing of the liberal human rights discourse. That is one that sought to divest it of its inherent moral myopia, which is a phrase of Bill O'Neill's, the moral myopia of racism, ethnocentrism, and sexism. And then to reimagine uh, human rights through a genealogical, multi-religious, intercultural, global conversation about what we owe to each other. Recent work in Catholic Social Ethics by Bill O'Neill, his Reimagining Human Rights, Religion and the Common Good, and also by David Hollenbach's Humanity in Crisis, continue this tradition of reframing and each positions human rights as a crucial lens through which the demands of Christian witness in the context of climate emergency can be expressed. When it comes to the issue of gender, I think that a human rights approach also provides an important corrective or supplement to the integral ecology framework of Laudato Si. Now, much has already been said about the fact that Laudato Si makes no reference to women, even though the majority of the world's poor are women, and also that there, and also because there are specific gendered dimensions to the ecological crisis. Um, in fact, Maurizio and Sharon this morning already referenced this. Indeed, I think this giant gendered blind spot of Laudato Si is itself probably a reflection of a more deep-seated lacuna in Pope Francis' theological vision, which has actually, as people will know, have been, has been much analyzed, but which is not the focus of our conversation today. A more fundamental concern than the absence of a gendered lens in Laudato Si, however, is how deeply linked the concept of integral ecology is with the human ecology and ecology of man theologies of St. John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI, each of which I think posits an essentialist and patriarchal reading of human ecology. Now, many feminist theologians, including Christiana Zenner and Maura Ryan, have highlighted how Pope Francis' predecessors used the language of human ecology to critique contemporary gender theories, including feminist theological accounts of gender. Moreover, for Pope Benedict and also for Pope Francis, there is a strong link between this essentialist reading of gender through the lens of a particular account of natural law and the ecological vision that sustains environmentalism. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis continues to insist that valuing one's own body in its femininity or masculinity, and thus honoring binary sexual difference and presumably heteronormativity, is crucial in sustaining integral theology, e integral ecologies. So, while the integral ecology of Laudato Si is indeed a vital resource when tackling climate change, it's anchoring in an essentialist view of gender that has not been repudiated, coupled with its failure to recognize the gendered aspects of the ecological crisis, suggests to me at least that it must be supplemented by other frameworks, including from those from Catholic social ethics, if a gender sensitive approach to climate change can be advanced. And the human rights tradition is I think an important resource in this regard. So in what follows, I want to briefly discuss the human rights impact of climate, the climate emergency, discuss how human the human rights of women and how um, uh, human rights more generally uh, particularly affect the gendered aspects of existence, and then highlight some of the features of a renewed human rights language that can help us advance a gender sensitive approach to climate change. So um, the climate emergency and human rights. In 2019, Philip Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, presented his report on climate change and poverty to the Human Rights Council. The report notes that climate change threatens truly catastrophic consequences across much of the globe, uh, and the human rights of vast numbers of people will be among the casualties. By far the greatest burden will fall on those in poverty, it notes, and it goes on to say that to date, 
human rights bodies have barely begun to grapple with what climate change portends for human rights. So what does climate change portend for human rights? Well, Alt Alston's report speaks of climate change as a threat that is likely to challenge or undermine the enjoyment of almost every single human right in the International Bill of Rights. Economic and social rights will be significantly impacted, already are. According to the World Bank, at two degrees centigrade of warming, another 100 to 400 million people will be at risk of hunger, and one to two billion more may no longer have access to adequate water. By 2050, climate change will likely displace 140 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. And also the last 50 years of development, global health and poverty reduction is at risk as more than 120 million more could be pushed into poverty as livelihoods and assets are more exposed and more vulnerable to natural disasters. People in poverty and those barely above the poverty line are greatly endangered by climate change and they're often precarious access to basic human rights to adequate water, sanitation, food, shelter, work, education, and healthcare are seriously under threat. And of course, we know that climate change also exacerbates inequality. Threats to civil and political rights are also likely amplified because of, climate, because of climate change. Indeed, one of the reasons why the language of climate emergency is so contentious is because state declared emergencies can often be an occasion or an excuse to increase government powers and to circumscribe civil and political rights. The political instability and insecurity caused by climate-induced migration and inequality poses risks of increased xenophobia, racism, and nationalism, all of which can undermine the civil and political rights of minorities and immigrants, as well as those who've been internally displaced or are refugees. Climate-induced conflicts whether involving state actors or private corporations, have also been a significant and ongoing source of human rights violations against human rights defenders, especially those from indigenous communities. And although data is difficult to come by, uh, nonetheless, the 2019 Global Witness Review of the no number of killings of environmental human rights uh, defenders highlights its severity internationally. So when we think then or speak then about the gendered impacts of climate change, uh, although women in high income countries are less vulnerable to the impacts of climate change than men in middle or low income countries, nonetheless, globally, women are at significant additional risk of its negative impacts on account of the discrimination and inequality embedded in patriarchal structures. Women constitute the majority of the world's poor, and thus are directly impacted when natural resources are compromised. Additionally, intersecting and multiple sources of marginalization bear on many women's lives. Moreover, cultural values and norms often impede women's capacity to adapt to climate change, thus increasing their vulnerability. Indeed, as has been noted by feminist scholars Nira Yuval Davis and Valentin Mogdam many decades ago, in times of crisis, gender norms often become even more rigid and women frequently bear heightened responsibility for the transmission of a community's norms and, for, and as the guarantors of its cultural identity. Now, February 2018 was actually the first time that a UN treaty body addressed the connections between human rights, gender and climate change through CEDAW's General Resolution 37. And in 2019, the UN Council for Human Rights produced a report that examines the impact of climate change on women's lives and human rights and, uh, and also looking at the gendered implications of climate change. And it delineates the most pervasive, pervasive and pernicious gender impacts of climate change. And I'd just like to speak very briefly to, to, to some of those. They include food security and access to land, because of course, gender equality is an important determinant of food security. Indeed, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, there's been a 
improvement in food security in developing countries because of women's empowerment. So uh, that uh, is, is, is an important factor. However, many smallholder farmers are women and therefore they're adversely affected by climate change. And also male dominated structures often govern land ownership, limiting women's opportunities to practice climate smart agriculture and also inhibiting access sometimes and often indeed to finance resources, tools and technology. There are impacts in terms of livelihoods and decent work that are linked to uh, food security and access to land. And we see around um, the globe and has, as has already been discussed in our earlier um, uh, uh, case studies, climate induced loss of livelihoods, reduction in incomes, deterioration in working conditions in agriculture and related sectors can have particularly negative implications for women. There are also impacts on health, on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Climate change often limits access to services, human mobility and the impact of extreme weather events on, can have negative impact on health infrastructure and decreases the access and quality uh, of the services. And of course, there is the serious issue of sexual and gender-based violence and discrimination. Uh, climate change certainly deepens poverty and creates social instability, both of which make women and LGBTQI persons much more vulnerable to gender-based violence. Um, we can see um, very harmful coping mechanisms. Disaster displacement makes uh, individuals far more vulnerable to gender-based violence and trafficking, often as we've seen in relief centers. Um, and um, human mobility, which is also greatly increased uh, because of climate change, um, poses unique risks to women and LGBTQI persons. Um, it can uh, contribute to increased human trafficking. Um, uh, it can influence gender dynamics by entrenching traditional gender roles and existing inequalities. Uh, and uh, overall um, poses uh, very serious effects. So the hazards um, uh, are great uh, for, for all individuals and they have particularly, a particularly um, gendered hue. And, and then finally, just to say in, in relation to this context, um, in the context of um, the impact on environmental human rights defenders, um, often women and uh, LGBTQI human rights defenders play a very high price. Uh, in common with all human rights defenders, they face risks, uh, including assassination, criminalization, intimidation and assault, but they also face added threats of gender specific violence and sexual violence that can have a very adverse effect uh, in terms of uh, the social consequences as well, such as st stigmatization and discrimination. So multiple expert reports and decades of development work confirm that the human rights of women and minorities can only be protected when the impacts of climate change are addressed. And also that climate change can only be effectively mitigated when its gender related aspects are also tackled directly. They are symbiotic and mutually reinforcing. So in this final session, section, I want to draw out some of the features of human rights language that I think are important as we seek to advance a gender sensitive approach to climate change and also to imbue climate action with the urgency and priority that it requires. So the first um, aspect I want to draw attention to is uh, focused on the human rights obligations of state and non-state actors. So the concept of human rights, as we know, is grounded in the inherent and equal dignity of all human beings and it sets out the obligating features of this equal dignity. In David Hollenbach's very compelling words, we can say that one human being is a kind of ought in the face of another, 
These obligating features, which uh, Hollenbach categorizes into, categorizes into basic needs, core freedoms, and essential relationships, these obligating features ground human rights and impose duties, including the duty to protect and advance human rights whenever they are at risk. Primary responsibility resides with states, and with its option for the poor, the Catholic tradition assigns to states a particular duty to address the alarming growth in poverty and global inequality. However, the human rights obligations of businesses are also significant, yet notwithstanding the obligations contained in the various legal instruments, this is the major failure of contemporary climate action. The Alston Report issues a scathing indictment of states' failure to protect human rights in the context of climate change. He is equally damning of corporate actors, not only because of widespread greenwashing practices, but also because of the way neoliberal globalization undermines economic and social and often civil and political rights of individuals and of communities, especially but not exclusively in the global south. So a focus on human rights, I think, requires that we have an immediate and honest conversation about the obligations and duties of states and corporate actors, and also about the urgent need for more effective enforcement measures that will hold governments and corporate actors to account for their support of and complicity with international business practices that undermine human rights and drive climate change. The second aspect of uh, the human rights framework that I think is important and useful in this context relates to what's called the interdependence and indivisibility of human rights. Now, while the history of human rights in the 20th century is in part a story of rival emphases, either on civil and political rights or on economic, social and cultural rights, nonetheless, in recent decades, decades, the doctrine of the interdependence or indivisibility of human rights has held sway. This is a comprehensive vision that insists that civil, political, and econo civil, political economic, social, and cultural rights are inherently complementary and equal in importance, and that the violation of one damages the achievement of the others. So a threat like climate change that as um, in the words of Alston is likely to challenge or undermine the enjoyment of almost every single human right, inevitably requires a comprehensive response based on the interdependence and indivisibility of human rights. The policies that will be required to ensure respect for economic and social rights, water, land, shelter, livelihood, also require a civic and political context in which civil and political rights are assured. This is especially important when the livelihoods of communities at, are at risk, whether it be from the depletion of resources, privatization or deregulation. And in these contexts, we see all over the world, governments frequently seek circumscribe or curtail the basic liberties of citizens, and also now securitize large sections of civic life in order to protect the interests of global capital. Moreover, when we attend to the interest to, to gender, we can see that although efforts to shrink and reduce civic space, including freedoms of expression, assembly, and association, affect all human rights defenders, they disproportionately uh, affect and impact women and LGBTQI human rights defenders who have historically very limited civic space to begin with and who also face additional uh, gender specific obstacles, risks and violations. So the, com this commitment to the indivisibility of uh, human rights highlights the, the, this uh, uh, aspect it also, I think, highlights the importance of gender related rights, including reproductive rights, to protect individuals' uh, freedom and safety as people navigate the threats of climate change. 
And in this context also, I think the indivisibility of rights also moderates the perceived individualism of human rights discourse. We don't have time to discuss this now, but I think as we can see, and as it is noted, for example, in Bill O'Neill, by Bill O'Neill, when he's discussing the human rights philosophies of Nairari and Tutu, he, he notes that the rhetorical practice of human rights in our concrete narrative traditions preserves the mutual recognition of agents as worthy of respect thereby permitting us to speak of moral solidarity. And then thirdly, uh, practices of deep democracy and human rights. In the context of civil and political rights, participation rights are especially important because the meaningful and informed participation of individuals and communities of diverse backgrounds is essential for effective climate action. This is not only essential in relation to women and those from minority groups, and in indigenous groups, it's also vital in dealing with political presentism that systematically excludes the interests and rights of future generations from the conversations about climate change. So the deep democracy that's needed to expand the political imagination to include the interests of future generations must also vindicate the participation rights of individuals and communities around the world who today are shut out of deliberations and decisions about the climate emergency. Uh, Roman Krasnarek speaks about the need for design principles of deep democracy that will safeguard the interests of um, disenfranchised youth and future generations. And I completely agree with him on this, but it's also important that this radically inclusive proposal take account of those who are currently without voice and influence in this context. The principle of subsidiarity is also important in this regard, um, as it's been invoked and developed in Laudato Si, um, and it's something that uh, I think is also worth emphasizing. In doing so, we see the importance of a broad-based civil society-led, inclusive and multidimensional approach to climate action. And so in a way, the problem must be tackled top down and bottom up. So in conclusion, while human rights discourse I accept is limited and flawed, I think it's nonetheless an important framework through which to pursue the imperatives of climate action. It is, as Hans Joas says, essentially the story of the sacralization of the person, although it's a story that continues to be reshaped by feminist decolonial and subaltern scholars and activists whose voices disclose new blind spots and reveal new depths of intersectional uh, oppression. And the climate emergency also has disclosed further blind spots in human rights discourse and has revealed even more deep-seated intersectional injustices. Is human rights discourse fatally anthropocentric? Can and should the remit of this tradition be expanded to include other animals? Can it animate a biocentric ethics by which a generalized respect for the concrete other warrants respect for the intrinsic values of non-human nature? That's how uh, Bill O'Neill asked this question. Can the unrealized promise of distributive justice that was initially bound up with the post-war ideal of human rights be achieved in the context of climate justice? These and other questions must continue to be grappled with, yet notwithstanding the challenges, I think that human rights continues to be an important lens through which the social transformation that is essential for human and planetary flourishing can be pursued. So as I've argued elsewhere, human rights can function as ethical assertions about the critical importance of certain values for human and planetary flourishing, as an emerging consensus generated in an intercultural intersectional conversation and as emancipatory politics. And also uh, to, to reference Bill O'Neill again, finally, as, as what he calls the grammar of dissent whereby human rights also becomes the catalyst for a politics that will necessarily be restorative, redeeming what Gutierrez calls the rights of the poor or the most vulnerable, including, importantly, the rights of redress. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Linda, for a very powerful and compelling address. Uh, we have as part of our structure today a, a formal response to Linda's paper by Reverend Dr. Patrick Reardon, who is a fellow Jesuit, a fellow resident at Campion Hall, in fact, and where he is a senior fellow in political philosophy and Catholic social thought. Uh, Patrick will speak for about 10 minutes and then we will be happy to take questions to either Linda or to Patrick. So Patrick, over to you, please. Thank you indeed, Frank, and a special thanks to Professor Hogan, to Linda. Great to have you with us in Oxford, even if it is only virtually yet again. I think the last time we spoke in the Oxford context was when you attended our Laudato Si Connecting Ecologies conference some years ago. So we're very grateful to Professor Hogan for this stimulating paper. She has underlined the urgency of the crisis and the way in which climate change is a genuine emergency for the protection of human rights. Second, she has made us even more aware of how women are disproportionately negatively affected by the emergency with cultural factors reinforcing their deprivation. And third, in considering the emphasis of Pope Francis on integral human ecology, echoing contributions from John Paul II and Benedict XVI, she draws attention to the need for a more sophisticated anthropology in the church's discourse to accommodate issues raised in recent conversations about gender, sex, and identity. So these are three very valuable points to focus our attention. But I see my role as respondent not merely to repeat the highlights, but to raise questions that might advance the discussion. And so I'm going to use my few minutes to raise three questions. So what exactly is the relationship between human rights and the climate crisis? Secondly, how do human rights frame a response? And thirdly, would the focus on values quoting Gil O'Neill there, or perhaps on the human good or common goods, would that be more useful? So to the first question, how are human rights and climate crisis related? Linda suggests in her paper that human rights can help provide a framework for response in which the interconnectedness of the economic, political, environmental, and cultural dimensions of the emergency are foregrounded and in which the perspective of vulnerable individuals and communities is central. In asking what does climate change mean for human rights, she cites Alston's report on climate change and poverty, foreseeing, I quote, climate change as a threat that is likely to challenge or undermine the enjoyment of almost every human right in the International Bill of Rights economic and social rights will be significantly impacted. In other words, if I understand correctly, the environmental degradation and social and economic disruption caused by the climate crisis will make it ever more difficult to protect human rights, especially those of the poor and vulnerable, particularly women. The degraded environment is a commons in this case, a bad commons that negatively impacts the human rights of everyone, but some people more than others. In this sense, it is like a natural disaster, such as a volcanic eruption. We see one recently at, in Goma in Eastern Congo, something that affects the lives of everyone in its ambit. Or to take a human-made commons, a state of war also creates a bad commons that affects everyone in the war zone, making their lives difficult, if not impossible. If I have understood this correctly, there is no direct link between human rights and the climate crisis. The crisis makes it particularly difficult to deliver human rights protection, especially to the vulnerable. Just as the COVID pandemic made it very difficult to deliver education to children, particularly to those from poor families, 
lacking access to broadband, Wi-Fi, or electronic devices. In other words, the point seems to be that the whole regime of human rights protection and provision is harmed by the crisis. Rather than that we identify a particular right or set of rights that have been violated by someone's action for the consequences of which they can be held responsible. But the point was made in the paper that human rights should frame our response to the crisis. And so my second question is, how can human rights help provide a framework for response? Admittedly, human rights language is ambiguous, being both a language for use in moral discourse and a related language for use in legal discourse. They are related, but I take it that our focus here is on the moral. And so I wonder if the moral language of human rights is in fact the best one for framing the human response. The danger is that the use of rights language restricts the moral scope of the discussion. So let me explain. Human rights are moral claims possessed by all human beings simply in virtue of their humanity. These claims are rooted in persons' interests when they generate duties or obligations on the part of others to respect, protect, and promote those interests in various ways. So the rights are moral claims that are correlated with duties and obligations on the parts of others. The violation of an obligation is a moral wrong. But of course, no wrong is committed simply by thwarting another's interests, for instance, by outperforming them in a competition, or by leaving those interests unpromoted, for instance, by refusing to donate a kidney. The point here is that even in asserting human rights as moral claims, they entail the identification of individuals who have duties to meet those claims. The duties can be either negative, not to harm or interfere, or positive, to provide something that is needed. Those interests in relation to which we can raise moral claims and with regard to which persons have moral duties or obligations are linked to our human well being. However, when it comes to declaring that someone has a duty, for instance, an employer has a duty towards an employee or towards a stakeholder because of their human right, we cannot be vague because we're asserting that there are important obligations that those persons should meet. Let us consider persons' interests that make sense of human rights claims, for instance, to healthcare or to education. We might be able to specify who is obliged not to interfere and who is obliged to provide support or means. The difficulty of relying exclusively on human rights discourse in such cases is that rights cannot exhaust the full range of responsibilities that exist in the situation. In both these areas of health and education, persons themselves have duties to care for their own health or to pursue the truth, or to enlarge their capacity for life and relationships. But these duties cannot meaningfully be grounded in corresponding rights claimed by individual persons, at least, I think, not without great intellectual contortion. And so my third question, would it be more helpful to focus on values, on the human good, on common goods, than specifically on rights? Nigel Bigger, in his recent book, What's Wrong with Rights, is critical of elements of the tradition of human rights discourse in the Catholic context, while appreciating that it situates rights talk in a wider moral discourse. I quote, the modern Catholic tradition of rights, he says, does display a superior ability to recognize the larger multifaceted moral order of which rights are only a part. And it does recognize that morally justified positive rights are the socially contingent products of political deliberation about the common good. So much from bigger. Emphasis on right order as distinct from an order of rights characterizes that tradition. What bigger objects to is the tendency to speak about human rights 
without tying down who exactly has a duty to meet the moral claims of relevant persons. An example is the assertion of entitlement to maternal health care for mothers and babies in impoverished situations without consideration of what resources are available or who might be in position to meet the claims. I suggest that we can make sense of this usage. Within the Catholic context, I suggest, rights are used as a shorthand for identifying important human goods in which people have interests as aspects of their well-being and flourishing. Following Aquinas in understanding law, whether moral law or civil law, as reasonable direction towards the good, those goods intrinsic to human well-being can be expressed as rights without falling into the unreality of thinking there are identifiable agents whose explicit duties it is to provide the goods to identifiable persons, regardless of practicability or context. So I'm suggesting that the discourse of human rights should be included within a wider horizon of reflection on the human good and on common goods. And in making this suggestion, of course, I am aware of colleagues also in the Laudato Si Research Institute who will want to make a similar case for prioritizing capabilities, an approach that I think can also be included within a common goods perspective. And so I conclude with a word of thanks for a most stimulating paper that has achieved its purpose for this listener, and I trust for the audience. We have been informed, provoked, and pointed in the direction of further exploration. And so we thank you again, Linda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. For the moment, there is just one uh, question and answer, question from the listeners. And because it's a, a rather straightforward, practical question, I will take that first before coming back to some of the uh, the kind of philosophical and, uh, and issue-based discussions that Patrick has launched in response to the paper. The, the first question from the floor is simply uh, to put to Professor Hogan, how can we relate ecology, economy and women in an Asian context? Um, thank you, uh, Frank, and uh, also thank you very much, uh, Pat, for that very um, thought-provoking response. And I hope we can, um, you know, discuss some of those issues either online or offline at some stage. Um, but in in relation to the the question um, from the floor about relating ecology, economy, and women in an Asian context. Um, well, I suppose, first of all, I would want to reference Sharon Bong's um, paper earlier this morning, where she spoke about um, the import, how the, the intersecting concerns of um, uh, climate inequalities and gender inequalities. And she gave us a very vivid, I think, and also um, uh, compelling analysis of the way in which um, these different elements are intersecting. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose um, what, what I would say is that um, uh, each context um, uh, has different uh, and intersecting um, challenges and, uh, and women and men in those contexts have different and intersecting vulnerabilities. And so it is certainly the case, I think, that as I've been sort of arguing through the paper, that, uh, and as Patrick has highlighted, that um, human rights, uh, that, that, that the climate change challenges profoundly the achievement of human rights, whether they're economic, social, uh, and in this case, case economic, I suppose, uh, social, cultural, in, in each context. And I, I hope that what I did in the paper was draw out some of those, um, talking about uh, food security, land, uh, live, decent livelihoods, access to, um, you know, all of the basic uh, 
uh, goods uh, like water, uh, food, etc., but also civil and political rights. We see, well, indeed, as, as Sharon discussed earlier, uh, the, the assault on civil and political rights that really is um, uh, connected, uh, I don't know if you say occasioned by, but she did, I think, uh, with um, responses to um, uh, climate action by um, uh, individuals and groups in, in, in Sharon's case in Malaysia, but I'm sure that there are many other contexts in, in, in which similar um, challenges are faced. Could I come in there and just add something to that answer? Because whenever this theme comes up, I suspect um, that when people are asking about the Asian context, that they're focusing on a different, different cultural context than we're familiar with in the West. So that the presupposition that you mentioned in passing in your paper, the presupposition of individualism and individual freedom and so on, that is very much part of the development of the human rights tradition that that's not the spontaneous culture in Asia. Uh, and so the, the, the being bonded in a cultural context in which there are very strong cultural norms of, of service to the community or being at the disposal of the community and so on, that whether there are particular, particular vulnerabilities that women have. And I think you did mention that in your paper, the cultural uh, elements that can be uh, an entrapment for women. Just my only, my own, only familiarity with Asian experiences is through my work in the Philippines, where of course, uh, women are very much um, active leaders in local communities, politically as well. And uh, in civil society, they're very often the more articulate, um, more capable of making the networking so that the Asian context in their case is not a debilitating one particularly. Now, I'm, of course, very happy to hear people reporting from more detailed research. My report there is purely anecdotal. Thank you. Um, I'd like, I think, to bring Linda back to what, what she would like to pick up from the response. But if I may ask one uh, question first. On the inter interdependence and indivisibility, indivisibility of human rights, and you do uh, mention in your paper that there has been a history of, right, of rival emphases on rights. Uh, but I wonder if, there's a, if it goes further than that in some cases, where there's a real pressing tension between the, uh, the attainment of different rights. One you highlighted, gender would be one, but one you highlighted in your paper was the rights of future generations. Uh, is, is there is it possible to avoid some sense of competition, at least in rights claims? Um, yes, uh, I, I think you're right to, to, to ask that question, Frank. And of course, right claim, rights claims in, um, in political contexts are inevitably always in opposition with each other. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, um, it really the the emphasis that I wanted to bring to in, in talking about the interdependence, which I think actually is probably a better phrase than indivisibility, but you know obviously the indivisibility of rights has a ha, has a, a sort of a claim and a force that is is intended uh, in, in, in also in a political context. but um, I, I do think inevitably rights claims are, um, in competition, uh, but I think um, what has what has tended to um, you know shape a lot of human rights uh, discourse over the decades has been either an emphasis on civil and political or economic and social, and so. Uh, particularly uh, when we see responses to, um, uh, the, to um, difficulties and challenges in terms of um, uh, international actors in polit 
particular contexts um, where uh, protection of the of of the environment is at uh, is at stake. Um, I think you there you see the the interdependence because very often, as I said in my paper, we see this um, the um, uh, subversion of or limitation of civil and political rights. Um, and um, what's been offered as an alternative is economic well-being or, you know, some kind of um, uh, immediate secure economic security. And uh, really, the, the point there is that this is a false dichotomy uh, and that, as I said, that, you know, um, uh, context that um, in, in which uh, economic and social uh, and cultural rights can be secured really require a need, uh, a, a political and civil context in which uh, there are, there is, you know, freedom, the possibility of association of dissent and, and all of these important um, rights. Thank you. So, uh, so sorry, so, excuse me, just the, the final point is very, the, these rights are, off, rights are often in competition, but I don't accept they, that they uh, fall into the, the competing discourses of either civil and political or economic and social and cultural. So, and especially with relation to the fairly dismissive term about third generation rights, for example. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes. And, uh, you know, your, your, your question, you're framing the question about the, the rights of future generations is, is, is important there because I think we're really, um, you know, we, we do see some uh, lawsuits now that are attempting to provide to, to protect aspects of the environment uh, using uh, the claim rights claims of future generations, you know, through various um, in various um, national courts. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I think it is um, we're really only beginning to grapple with, you know, whether whether this is indeed something that uh, will um, uh, have a, a, a future um, in the context of all of the competing um, current uh, rights claims. Yes, thank you. So at least indivisibility in a weak sense that you cannot write off any of these rights as if it's not a, a bona fide claim. Thank you. Uh, there are other questions, but uh, the the framework of one hour can't be stretched very easily. So I apologize to a, a couple of written questions, because maybe the most important thing to do in the last couple of minutes, was there anything in what uh, Patrick said that you particularly wanted to pick up? Uh, well, thank you very much, Frank. Um, you know, I suppose, um, I, I think I, I uh, sort of responded to, to Pat, Pat's fir first question, but, um, you know, the, 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 the core question about, you know, how, how useful is rights language um, or um, it, it, is the language of value and common good not a better uh, language? Um, I, I think, I hope what I um, demonstrated in my paper is, you know, I am not a, 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 an absolutist in terms of human rights language. I regard it as an important framework and lens through which we can uh, highlight certain um, aspects of the, the claims that others have on us and that the responsibilities that we have. Um, I, uh, it cannot, of course, uh, and, and perhaps it is um, uh, too limited, perhaps its um, resonances are too, you know, problematic in terms of heritage, in terms of um, uh, the um, individualism, uh, etc. But, um, you know, I suppose I, I do come back to that phrase that I think is in Pachamin Terrace that where um, it, it speaks about um, human rights being uh, the, the language through which human dignity can best be protected in the social context. And, um, you know, maybe we would quibble about whether it can best be, but it can be protected, you know, can be protected well. So I don't see this as, uh, I don't see this as a sort of a, a necessary um, prioritization or absolutization of rights. 
um, I think it, it, it provides an important lens. It connects us with a number of different things, including the legal, which I know Pat suggested is a sort of maybe problematic because it's 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 introducing uh, another order of uh, of of discourse and therefore you know uh, uh, confusing potentially confusing and problematic but in a way I think because it does link us to those um, uh, orient us towards those legal uh, obligations I think it's also helpful I I, I do believe I I think that the capabilities approach is very uh, useful and and important as well. Um, I actually think it has similar limitations and problems <laughs> as human rights discourse does, um, uh, particularly in relation to the um, you know the anthropocentric nature of both. Um, but um, you know I, what I would say is that um, it is an important and useful lens. Uh, but by no means the only one. And just the final point to make on it is, I, I, as I said in the beginning, I think because human rights language has had this um, reframing um, through feminist, decolonial and subaltern lenses, it is, I think, um, proper, probably more attuned to its own limitations than other discourses that we might use. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both our speaker, Linda, and our respondent, Pat. There are a couple of questions uh, written, but uh, I, no doubt if we prolong this for half an hour, there would still be a queue of questions that we can't get round to. So I apologize to those respondent to those questioners, and perhaps you can find another way of forwarding the question for later attention. Uh, it, just to close, I would like to hand back to Celia Dean Drummond for a final word. Hey, um, thank you so much, uh, both Linda and Pat, for a really, really stimulating session that we've just had. Um, I have to admit that at the beginning of the lecture, I felt a little bit skeptical about human rights, but by the end, I actually became more convinced, especially in terms of its more sophisticated engagement with gender than some of the other frameworks. So I think climate change and um, climate emergency, or rather, as you call it, is so crucial that we need all the tools that we have at our disposal in order to tackle it. So thank you so much, uh, both of you, for really stimulating and engaging um, discussion and thank you for those who've raised questions. I'm sure there'll be many more as we think about it overnight. Um, but this is the end of today and um, please um, uh, join us tomorrow for a, a continuation of our, our conference and thank you once again for being part of our discussion here at the LSRI. So thank you.